few months ago, Shopify's engineering have uh, posted this interesting blog, and brilliant, in fact, uh, talking about top 10 tips for building a resilient payment system. And uh, I'll, I'll reference the blog for you guys and the description and the show notes. But and each of these 10 tips is absolutely well crafted just for their use cases. And in this particular uh, episode, I'd like to focus on just one of these tips, because e frankly speaking, each one of these tips is its own content, it is own article. You know? And uh, there's not much details, but boy, you can extract so much if you understand the fundamentals. So for this particular show, I'll focus on the database engineering aspects, specifically tip number six, which is uh, to use item potency keys right and how they use a unique key that optimizes their inserts and select and queries for identity potency keys how about we jump into it all right so uh i talked about what item potency is in another video basically in a nutshell item potent request or item potent backend is when you send a request and this request is repeatable such that it doesn't change the state on the backend, right? An example is a GET request. A GET request by definition must be item important because if I do a read on a specific endpoint, if I send that read twice, uh, it doesn't matter. Nothing changes on the backend. Nothing should change, right? Uh, POST, on the other hand, by definition is always not item important, right? Unless you make it to be. If you post, if you insert a row, repeating that insert is basically will change the state. You don't want that. It's not a desired behavior. Right? So if your endpoint says, okay, slash post, and that creates a new entry, for example, let me fix my mic. And of course, Shopify being a payment system, you want the ability to retry a payment without actually causing a double spend. You don't want to pay for something twice. That's never fun, right? And the opposite side for merchants, you don't want, uh, if that happens, you don't want an accidental twice of a refund, right? So that's why item point is here is a critical concept. I'm gonna reference the video for you guys if you're interested to learn more about that item potency is a very critical concept right? you have to build it yourself you have to configure your backend to be item potent doesn't it's not for free right that's why something called an upsert is a thing right where you insert but if this exists it becomes an update an upsert is an item potent concept okay so let's go ahead and read this blurb and the in this particular blurb they talk about okay the importance of item potency blah 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 we know right but here's the important thing that i am going to spend uh, the most of the show about just talking about that particular thing okay because it fascinated me the brilliance of shopify engineering when it comes to database level tuning and data modeling which is very underrated all right, let's, let's go ahead and read this. An item potency key needs to be unique. Well, that's that's important, right? Because in this particular case, when they send a request, they add a key to uniquely identify payment requests. That's how you identify a payment or a request, right? If someone retried the same request with the same key that you know this is an actual retry that's whether happening from the user or from a proxy or from a reverse proxy or from an api gateway some any middle layer that does the retry it doesn't matter we know that a retry has happened right sometimes the user go back and then forward and then hit refresh and then you get this message oh do you want to resend it again you say yes and that sends the same technical request ID unless you went all the way and generated a brand new request ID and physically wanted to 
pay again that's a different story but most of the uh the item potency key requests are sent within within a few seconds right but what they do here is an item potency key needs to be unique for the time we want the request to be retriable and that's a very critical use case for them they don't want the request to be retriable infinitely right if you send a request in 2018 a payment request in 2018 it's not gonna live until 2022 that doesn't make any sense it should live within they they estimate a payment request to live within a 24 hour if you never made a, a payment within a 24 hour it it was a failed for example on the back end for any reason we can try to retry it within this amount but if after that it says hey you know what all bets are off just do it again right we will email you to say hey we could not retry that so typically 24 hours or less that's a that's something you add as a as a designer and architect we prefer using and here's the interesting part we prefer using an and universally that sounds like a typo a universally unique lexicographically sortable identifier or this thing that's called ulids right so you this is your, called ulid right for these item potency keys instead of a random version for UUID. So if you don't know, universal unique identifiers is, or sometimes in Microsoft we call them GUEDs or globally unique identifier, is a certain number of bits. I forgot, I think 128 bits, if I'm not mistaken. 128 bits. And these 128 bits are guaranteed to be unique. If you can generate them on the device and then you are... 99% sure that's going to be unique, which is powerful concept. Why do you want to use those? Right? You want to use those because you want the client to generate a unique ID as opposed of a database or a backend to generate a sequential unique identifier. Because you see, sequential identifiers are very powerful because uh, sequence is beautiful in databases. Databases like or like ordered things it likes things that are ordered because they can put them on the same page and it can query them and it can they be tucked in nicely to, uh, to each other the problem is uh, generating a sequence is very expensive because you have to talk to the database to give you a unique sequence right so there is a center point to generating like almost a center point of failure where we ask someone to give us a unique id versus the client just generates it and we know it's unique. So that's why UUIDs are very powerful. The problem with UUIDs are they are random. Eh? Oh, why does that? Why is that a problem? Let's continue reading and continue, uh, and explain that a little bit more. ULIDs contain a 48-bit stamp timestamps followed by an 80-bit. So I was right. 128. Is that right? Yeah, 128. If I can do math. So, followed by 80 bit of random data. So, ULIDs, LID, has some sort of an order to them. So, the first 48 bit has a timestamp. And this timestamp will, uh, uh, will inject some sort of an order to these random UUIDs. What is the benefit of these? The timestamp allow ULIDs to be sorted, unlike random UUIDs, which are not sorted, which works much better with a B3 data structure databases user for indexes. In one high throughput system at Shopify, we've seen a 50% decrease in insert statement duration by switching from a UUID version 4 to a UU ULIDs for item potency keys. And that's all what they say. They don't tell you how, they don't tell you why, but I'm here to actually explain why this is the case and why it is faster. Because everything, once you understand how databases work and how the fundamentals of first principle of databases, this is just like reading one plus one equal two. So let's explain that. So you see, you... you their databases here 
they don't spell it out, but it's MySQL, right? MySQL, right? Primary keys are called a, a clustered index, which means that if you pick a primary key that is, for example, an integer, a clustered primary key index is the table itself. So what does that mean? If your integer is the primary key, then the index structure at the end, there is the leaf pages where basically the pointers of where this integer points to is the actual pages of data, right? So if you have a row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, row six, row seven, eight, nine, ten, these are tucked in nicely together in a single page. And not only there are the values, but every single column in the table is in the leaf page. So if you search for the value of seven, right, you will find seven, right? And you will find the row seven, you'll find the, all the columns that belongs to row seven. That's how clustered indexes work. And not only you find row seven, you're going to row, row, find row eight, row nine, 10. If 11 doesn't exist, you're going to find 12 next to it. And not only just the values, 12, uh, 10, 12, and, and 13, you're going to find all the columns. And because of this order, if you look up for row seven, you will traverse the B3, you find row seven, and you're going to find any rows that is next to it. So if you're doing range scans, it is really beautiful, right? Because it's like, oh, give me all the rows between seven and 12. Oh, that's that's a cheap query for uh, B plus trees, right? And because we are searching on an indexed, a kind of clustered index, not only we find, it's almost like an index only scan. It is an index only scan in this particular case, right? All right, that's nice. We're reading an integer value. Right, and uh, integer values are ordered in this particular clustered index. So nice, I get, I get all the next values next to it. But what if I'm inserting? If you're inserting rows one and then 10 and then thousand, they are not ordered and you're inserting 20,000 and then you turn around and insert three, the database must insert the row three in the same page that has the one, right? Because it needs to order them. And not only it needs to order, it needs to order the index, it needs to order the whole row, right? So the pages must be ordered. And the that's the that's the that's both the advantages and disadvantages of a clustered index. So now if we take, if we move this into the primary key, concept with a UUID, which is a random one. You generate a UUID, which is random. It's the table is empty. You're going to insert in the first page, you create a brand new page and you insert it, right? And then the second UUID is also random. Well, we don't have anything else. We just have this one and we order it. And this one happened to be right after it. And then you keep inserting and inserting random, random goods, right? And shifting the results as you find out. As the tables start to grow, as you start inserting these random goods, you will find yourself pointing to random pages because guess what? They, there is no order of the, the way you're inserting these things. They are not ordered at all. So you need to find where this random goods should live based on their order. Eh? It's exactly identical to inserting random integer values identical. So if you insert value one and then value thousand and then, then value three million and then seven million and then you turn around and insert two, you need to find the page where two lives. That's exactly next to the one, right? So random insertion will just be will cause random IOs. So we'll, we'll, we will do an IO, fetch that page, get in memory, which is called also the buffer pool in MySQL, and then put it nicely in memory. And let's just hope that this page will receive another write, which will never write, which will almost never receive another write because everything is random, right? So you get a, get this page, you insert 
insert that random grid and then you insert another random UUIDs and guess what? It's not on the same page. You have to fetch the page that needs to live in. You fetch another page, you write it and put it in memory. So now we have two pages in memory and then another random. Again, it's not on these pages. It's another page. So you end up filling the buffer pool, which is the memory, with pages that almost receive just one or two writes. That's bad because what happens is you will fill up your memory, the buffer pool, with pages that are almost never used. It's almost you're going to read the entire data with with UUID. That's why it's bad. That's why it's inserts are slow right and i'm focusing on inserts because reads are also bad but inserts are the worst because now inserts you have to read the page and then write to the page and then write to the wall which is the right ahead log and then flush the page with checkpoints so not only you slow down writes because to receive a write you have to read put it in memory and then write to it. And if it's not in memory, you have to go and do an IO. So inserts are always almost causing an IO, right? And guess what? What if the buffer pool fills up, which it will? <laughs> Give it a few million requests, which Shopify easily do in an hour, right? And then this buffer pool will fill up. So what does that mean? If, if it fills up, you can't even write, right? So what does that mean? You have to flush existing buffer pool pages back to disk. That is a cost. That is an expensive thing it's called checkpointing. Right? It's not exactly checkpointing, but it's part of the writing, flushing back the changes that you do on the data pages to disk. Checkpointing is something else. But when you flush these things, you have to flush them to disk, persist them, right? And then now that we... Wrote, wrote these dirty pages to disk. Now we have some free memory on the buffer pool. Let's read now that random page that this good has happened to live in and then insert it. And, and you see this thrashing that the database keeps doing, which is uh, awful. Right? So what those guys did, what Shopify did, is like they realized this big problem with the UID. So they said, hey, we still like UIDs. We, we like the uniqueness of the UIDs. I'm not going to introduce a, a centralized system for to generate unique IDs. That's just an, I mean, you can, but you created a bottleneck, right? All these requests, you can create a microservice that its sole job is to generate unique IDs that are integers. That works, right? And it will guarantee that no two services or, or two requests will get the same unique id you can do that but you have to serialize them right and it is it becomes a bottleneck so they still want to use the uid but they will use the ul id which is a timestamp base so these there is there is a, there is an order to this request and the order by time and it works perfectly for Shopify. Why? When you generate requests, they are time-based. They are absolutely time-based. Requests that are generated is definitely time-based. So if I generate a new request and I want to write it, right, in T0, the next request is T1, the next request is T3, the next request is T4, these requests will definitely will be one after the other. What does that mean in, in B3 speak? In B3 speak, if I, my primary key is the ULIDs, then I generate the T0 request, right? And again, I'm, I'm saying T0, but it's T0 followed by a random number, which the most important part is the first part <laughs> to, for the database, right? It's always left to right. And just like indexes, combined indexes, uh, uh, compound indexes have to go left to right as well, right? Same thing. So now you generate request to zero, request T1, request T3, T4, T5, and all of these, T0, guess what? Go to this page. And then where does T1 goes? Right in the same page, which is exactly what you want. So T0 first will say, okay, I don't have this page. Let me fetch it from disk, put it there, and then write to it. And then T request T1 comes in. It's not random, it's ordered. So T1, all the request that comes in almost always goes to the tail of the B3, right? Which is which is good, but there's also another problem that I'm going to mention. 
that they don't talk about it here. Uh, that page will receive many writes. So T1 will go to a T3, will go to a T4. All of these budget pages will, until it gets full, done. Leave it. It's almost impossible, improbable, let's say, that another request in, in the past will just come in out of the blue and then fetches a page from the past. And then you cannot insert a request in the past, right? All requests will come real time. Right? I guess, I suppose there is, there might be a bug. I will call it a bug in the client where the client generates the, the ULID, but it got disconnected. Right. And then later it was connected after an hour and then used that ID. That's fine. Right. That's fine. Sure. That is kind of an anomaly where an old request ID with an old timestamp will pull an old page to write to it because we have moved on already. But the goal here is all the requests that comes in will be nicely ordered. The buffer pool will almost have one or two or three pages. Right, and we're gonna write to the tail, always write to the tail. So, writes are fast. How about reads? Reads are also fast because, guess what? If you're gonna read a request, chances that this request you, you, ID that you just generated is just you just generated it. So, if you just generated it, chances that it is almost always in memory. It's a dirty page, right? So, yeah, you're gonna read this page that is effectively it's committed in the wall, but it's still in in the memory so we're gonna read it from memory so it's already there so reads are fast as opposed to random uuids which you just random they have no absolutely no uh order to them right then you're gonna query that and then you have to find the page where it lives and then pull it in memory and just hope that someone else will ask for the same page right but what the, because of their unique use case, Shopify, because of this request, the order of the request and the, the order they are come in and the fact that it's 24 hours or less, they built this so tight such that this works perfectly for them. ULIDs work perfectly for them. What's the problem here? There's a, another problem is a little thing called the mutexes and suppose it's, a, it's, it's an operating system thing. It's a computer science thing where it's a lock. I talked about pages in my medium and I'm, I'm, make, I'm making another video about it. Just talk about database pages. Very critical concept to understand. Right? Whether it's NoSQL, graph, doesn't matter. Every database has a concept of a page. Right? And it's different from the file system page and it's different from the SSD page. It has nothing to do with each other. Right? Page is nothing but an in-memory structure. And if you have multi-threading right, in your database, which almost you do, right, then multiple threads will try to write on the same page. right? And if you don't do it correctly, you can corrupt your page. right? Race conditions and all. So unless you build your structure so that, such that you can have two threads write in the same memory location, which is very hard, you have to acquire something called a mutex. And I think, in, if I'm mistaken, in... My SQL, they call them latches, or that might be SQL server, I can't remember. So you have to latch on the page. If a thread wants to write something, it latches to it, and then it writes, and then it unlatches, or, or release the mutex, right? And that constant, if you're writing to the tail, always, if you're like, if there's like thousands of requests always competing for the tail, you're gonna start seeing serialization Right, as, as, as threads being serialized. So you will see slight slowdown for that particular problem, but it's not as bad as having the buffer pool uh, filled up. I think they already realized this problem where this latching happened in the tail. Uh, I don't know if there's a solution to it, to be honest, right? Uh, I guess solution is to be having a little bit of randomness to it, right? But uh, for, for this particular case, uh, yeah, uh, maybe make the make the page size a little bit smaller right so that you have a little bit more pages but i don't know so that they can if you have a large page size i mean sql uh, my sql i know db is 16 and i have no idea if they configured that and changed it 16 kb so 16 kb can fill up real quick with with uids ulids i suppose and 
I have no idea what their table structure looks like. But yeah, it's it's interesting looking at all these things, right? They, they actually took full advantage of ULID the first time I've seen a full advantage of ULIDs, right? Now, we're going to be careful with this, right? So now we know there is a something called ULID and UUID is... Is you all the you you but what I want to say is don't just use ULID because it's a new thing. I think you still need to fix, make sure that it's a uh, uh, your use case actually fits it right nicely. Let's take an example. So let's say I want to make a, a URL shortener such that I don't want the user to select. Uh, anything right uh i just wanted to generate a unique short url based on the ul id so when you tell me hey this is a long url make it short i'll generate a ul id for you right? and based on that this is now the short url this is if you use normal random uuids inserts right a fleet of people will be creating short URLs, right? And in that particular case, randomness will hurt performance, especially in write performance, right? If you use ULIDs, then you can control the inserts because you know that people who generate the short URLs will be generating them one after the other. You're going to get a nice boost in insert performance with ULIDs generating short URLs. Again, if you have like, many many thousands of requests because this uld will come in and and the beauty here is uh, actually you can either have the client generate them or have the database generate them and if you do that all these keys that come in will will look up where should they fit and most probably they're going to be ordered because right requests to generate new urls will be in order and as a result they can all fit in in the nice nicely tucked in page instead of randomly right so that's nice but reads i don't think it's going to benefit you at all just same thing as uid read or will be still random you have absolutely no guarantee in this case to optimize read request unlike shopify oh shopify actually optimize both write and read because reading they will almost read requests that are within this 24 hours there's no point reading requests from seven years right back <laughs> doesn't make sense because hey we're building an item potency token here urls you have no control over that someone might request a url that you have created a year ago right and in that case you're gonna pull that page so with uid unfortunately a short you are a shortener this randomness the use case is random and there is absolutely no way i can think of to make it better for read request because right? because the, the 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 use case is random the read request is random you have no control of you what users urls visit right so this is a result is it's just a random and i have you have to configure your hardware based on that so just this is just an understanding of this i don't don't think that ulid will fix everything for you right so another disadvantage if you will is um, uh, the size right 128 is huge and if you're using mysql in particular not necessarily postgres but MySQL will uh, uh, secondary indexes point back to the uh, to the to the primary index key. So if you are like indexing another field that has nothing to do with the ULID, right? But you, I don't know, you're indexing the date, right, on which this is created, then this date will create an index and the values the keys is the date the values is what is the ulid because that's how uh mysql actually cluster indexes work right as this is the same recently in mongodb as well with clustered collections so if you're using mongodb and you decided to turn on cluster collections on your collections that is identical to mysql right now 
so the secondary indexes can blow it up based on the size of the primary key so just just something a fruit of thought to understand these things what's the problem of uh, large indexes like hey i have all the space in the world well you have all the space in the world but you don't have all the, all the memory in the world right if you do kudos but large indexes effectively need to be in memory to be effective in reading so if you have a large indexes with a lot of bloated secondary indexes and you have I don't know, 10 indexes can really add up and it can slow down writes as well and, and reads mostly. But right, guys, so this is what I wanted to discuss. A very interesting concept, ULID. And uh, I'll, I'll keep thinking more about it. It's like, where can this break? But in most of probably ULID is almost always better than UUID, right? But I'm yet to think about a case where both are actually not a good idea right size is one of them i suppose right but yeah but this is one of the first use cases that i saw that actually takes full advantage of ulids right brilliantly might i say so again good article i'm gonna reference it below in the show notes i uh, hope you enjoy this uh video podcast you guys see you in the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye